This happens to me all the time. People message me and they say, Rex, you will not believe the vintage wooden plane I just found. And I think, oh God, here it comes. And then the picture comes through. And, and the person's always so excited. They're like, can you believe this? And I think, okay, yeah, wow, look at that. There sure is. I have to be encouraging, you know, it's my job. There's so much, uh, there's so much history there, so much character. Yeah, that, that really is a find. And then the person says to me, okay, I'm gonna restore this plane. I'm gonna use your videos to do it. What do I need to look out for? And I think every, everything, every, every inch of this thing. <laughs> uh, honestly, with wooden planes, they're usually go, no go. Either they're savable and the restoration's pretty quick or they're firewood. This one is rough for sure, but I think we're gonna be able to fix it up and get it working pretty quickly. I've done that before in other videos. So what's the point of this video? Well, we haven't really focused on these irons before. Even if you've restored planes before, you might be used to old Stanley irons. Beautiful, factory-made, square, straight, well-behaved Stanley irons. If this is your idea of a vintage plane iron, you might get into this iron and Whew, there are some surprises waiting for you. Let's get into it. The iron is good and stuck, and this is no time to be timid. <laughs> Taking the plane apart, here we go. This is what I really like to see. I wanna pull up the wedge and see these distinct light spots right here. This means this wedge has been with this plane. All this color matches, and then this is the stuff that was shielded from dust and sunlight. This is the original wedge, almost guaranteed to be the original iron. Those are the biggest challenges you're gonna find with a plane like this. Let's check out the iron. Yeah, it's, it's not great. We've got a lot of mushrooming back here from being struck, very rusty. We might have some pitting. General condition is, it's, it's okay. The edge has some brightness to it, that's pretty good. And then this fastener here is gonna be very stiff. It's gonna be tough to get out. There's only two ingredients we need to take care of this chip breaker screw three-in-one oil, and time. So we're gonna put some of that on both ends, and then we're gonna give this thing about 10 minutes. To unscrew this fastener, it's time for the Hand Tool Hero multi-tool, right? Wrong. This is the wrong tool for a stuck, rusty fastener like this. For this, we need the size and torque of a full-size screwdriver, and it still might be a chip. Oh, nope. All right, three-in-one oil is pretty good stuff. And we're gonna rotate this off. Okay, one thing I hate to see is wood trapped in between. Wood in between the chip breaker and the iron is gonna attract water and it's gonna really encourage rust. So seeing this, I'm a little bit nervous to check out the back of the iron. And oh no, actually, it's really not bad. And it's brighter than I was expecting with no pitting. So. That's a great sign. I think we're gonna do a great restoration on this blade. People ask me all the time about chemical rust removers like acid or evaporust, and honestly, I don't like them at all for stuff like this. Um, they take time, and then there's a residue left over, and then your parts are wet. When you use the wire wheel, I'm gonna be done with all of these parts in under 10 minutes. They're gonna be dry, they're gonna be clean. There's one step and nothing else to do. So for small parts like this, for me, wire wheel. With the rust removed, we can see that this old iron from a wooden plane is much different than a Stanley you might be used to. These irons are laminated, forged, and tapered. And those are big differences. Laminated means that there's just a small piece of tool steel. We'll throw up a still frame, but you can see a dark line that goes from here right to here, and it's very narrow. That's all the steel, all the tool steel that's actually in this piece. It's a very small piece that was put on top of a piece of soft steel or wrought iron, and then they were heated and hammered together to forge weld them. That's the laminated construction. A little bit of tool steel here at the edge, and then the rest of it, a softer, cheaper, low carbon steel. A few Stanley irons were made laminated this way, but most of them were just a big piece of high carbon steel, cut to shape, and then hardened. So these are a little bit different. Now, they're also forged. That's how you get that laminated construction. But it also means these have a very rough texture. 
compared to those Stanleys. Up here, this is all rust, okay? But we don't have to worry about that because we're just gonna hit this with a hammer anyway. Oh, speaking of hitting with a hammer, this is really mushroomed over here. It's bent over a lot. And that's because this is a softer steel. A hardened high carbon steel wouldn't do this. Anyway, the last thing is these are tapered, which means they're actually a lot thicker at the business end and much thinner over here. That taper is the opposite of the wedge. And when they're tapered in opposite directions like this, they hold very tightly. Planes that have tapered irons and wedges adjust very easily. So these were really easy to make it a deeper cut or a shallower cut because of this specific shape. When we go to do the restoration, we have to worry about the bevel. Obviously, you're used to that if you've restored like a Stanley iron, but we also really have to worry about the back. And those shavings I found in between the iron and the chip breaker, they did their damage. They held moisture in here and we have pitting. You have deep little divots right in that tool steel. And right now, I don't know if this iron is savable or not. We're gonna go do some work on it. The problem with these pits is as we sharpen, the edge is gonna hit them. The edge of this blade then won't be straight anymore. It'll be wavy because it's hitting these pits in the steel. That's gonna leave tracks in your work. It won't be smooth. Pitting is the biggest fatal flaw in old plane blades. If we can't take care of this, we're not gonna be able to use this iron. Now the trick here is don't be timid. Don't put down some 1500 grit sandpaper or use a fine diamond stone. This is 100 grit aluminum oxide paper. I've glued it to my table saw and I'm gonna to go to work with this. I'm gonna put the back of the iron flat, close to the edge, firm downward pressure with two fingers, grab it with the other hand, confident strokes back and forth. You can see I'm taking off steel. Sandpaper is very efficient for this. After a few strokes, I can see what's up. Okay, the iron is not even close to being flat. You can see I've still got rust here and here, and that means it's high in the middle. This is the only shiny spot I have, and you can see those little dark spots there. These pits are pretty serious. So let me keep working and see what we can do. And still, same problem. Big high spot in the middle, still low spots on either side. I could hit this with a hammer to try and flatten it, but I don't like doing that with this hard tool steel. It can be very hard and it can crack. So I'm gonna try and keep lapping this flat. Okay, after a good half hour of lapping, there's good news and there's bad news. The good news is the back of this iron is flat. The steel is shiny and it looks great. This is really high quality steel. At least it looks good. The problem is I do have a lot of pitting at this edge. Way too much, especially here in the corner and over here. These are going to interfere with me ever getting a good edge out of this iron. But look at all the good steel behind them. There's so much good stuff back here. This iron could still have years of use left in it if I just get rid of this. So I'm going to do something a little drastic here. I'm going to grind away this whole part of the blade. I'm not gonna cut it away. Anything I did to cut it would heat the steel up too much and draw the temper. But if I go out into the back room and use my big stationary belt sander with an aggressive 60 grit belt, I'm gonna be able to grind past this without heating the steel up too much. I'm also gonna dip it in water a lot as I work to keep it cool, but then I'll have gotten rid of all the pitting. Now my iron at that point won't have any bevel left. I'm gonna to have to go back to the grinder and use the tool rest set at 25 degrees to slowly reestablish that bevel. Again, stopping a lot to dip it in water. This is gonna be a lot of work, but when I'm done, I'll have saved this iron. Now what's great is when you put in all that work and it actually, you know, works. So here's my new bevel and it's at exactly 25 degrees which is what I like. More importantly, if we look at the back, you can see all that deep pitting is gone. The minor pitting I have at the corners here is so slight I can't even feel it, and I'm gonna camber this blade anyway, so the corners aren't very important. What matters is all this clean, bright steel I have right here. This iron has years of life left in it. 
Now, I've been working it on this inexpensive fine diamond plate back here, and I'm getting a nice polish on the back, but you can probably see that polish is not extending all the way to the edge, and I haven't gotten the corners yet. I have to get this right so the chip breaker will mate on here. Now, one trick I could use to get that edge flat, this is called the David Charlesworth ruler trick. You just put a little machinist's rule at the back of your stone and then work it back and forth. That rule kicks the iron up just a tiny bit and you're guaranteed to get a flat spot right at the edge. But if you use this trick, then you need this ruler every time you sharpen. So I prefer not to do it that way. I'm gonna spend 10 more minutes at this stone now and I'm never gonna flatten the back of this iron ever again, and I'm not gonna have to worry about where my ruler is. So that's the way I like to do it. Now that we've got the back all flat and polished, it's time to hone and strop the bevel. I'm gonna use oil stones and sharpen freehand, but you can use any sharpening system you want. It does not matter. And while I'm honing this edge, I'd like to tell you about a live digital event that I'm doing with James from Wood by Wright and Anne from Anne of All Trades. We're doing a live digital 90 minute course in sharpening. Each of the three of us is gonna take 30 minutes and cover some key aspect of the craft. There's gonna be question and answer. We'll try to help people with specific problems. If you're struggling with sharpening, this could be the thing that helps to get you on track or takes your sharpening to the next level. Instead of having one person just tell you, this is the way to do it, we're gonna have three people sharing different approaches so you can adapt what we know to your style and your shop. We've got all the information on that, including the date and how to get tickets down in the description. So click on that link and find out all about it. This iron is done, but this chip breaker has not even begun. Getting this iron straightened out was a lot of work, but it's all for nothing unless we also work on the chip breaker. We need a perfect mating surface between the iron and the chip breaker, especially right here where the two edges meet. If these don't meet perfectly together, we're gonna get shavings in between the two irons and the plane is going to jam. So first thing we want is to test the flatness of the chip breaker. We can just lay it on top of our newly flattened iron we can tap the corners and listen very carefully for any sounds. That sounds okay. That's okay. That sounds okay. Whoop, you hear that? That little rattle tells me I've got at least one high corner. And even with the pressure of the screw, that gap is gonna mess things up. It's gonna twist the iron in a way that's not gonna help. So I need to flatten out this chip breaker. First thing I'm gonna do is put the leading edge on my sandpaper, get the body of the chip breaker below my surface and work it back and forth. I'm working on getting an aggressive knife edge on the underside of my chip breaker. Then I'm gonna take it over to my stones, refine that edge and work the bevel. This is a lot like sharpening an actual iron, working it back and forth, trying to get a smooth and polished surface, I'll even use the strop. The chip breaker is almost done, but this corner is still too high, it's still rattling. I've got everything else prepared, I just have to fix this, but chip breakers are made of soft steel, you can bend them. The best way to bend this corner is to have it clamped securely in place like this, and then just give it a tap. And probably one more. That's probably good. I'm gonna test this. I might take it back to my sandpaper and work on getting that flat surface a little bit. And I might hit it again. But with a little bit of tweaking, this is gonna be perfectly flat and it's gonna mate perfectly in front. And I'll show you how to test that. The iron and the chip breaker are ready to reassemble. I've got the screw right here. I'll put the screw in the hole. I have them held like a cross like this. And then I'm gonna rotate the chip breaker forward. This keeps the chip breaker away from the freshly honed edge of my iron, keeps it from getting dull all of a sudden. I'm gonna line those up and get the chip breaker very close to the edge. Now that this is clean and lubricated, now is the time for the Hand Tool Hero. It is designed to work on the maintenance of tools, not breaking free rusty fasteners. Use a screwdriver for that. Once I have these fitted, I need to make sure I've got a gap-free fit along this front edge. The way to do that is to hold it up, look in the side right here, there's a gap in the side, 
and look along the front. It's not difficult. I have filming lights, but you can just use the overhead lights in your shop, move it around and look in there. And you've got to be super exacting. If you see any little whispers of light anywhere along that edge, you need to go back and work on tuning the chip breaker more or flattening the back of the blade more. Except no excuses here. It has to be perfect. And now we're skipping ahead. In the interest of time, I did a super fast restoration on this plane. Scrubbed the entire body with steel wool and boiled linseed oil, got a toothbrush and cleaned and scrubbed inside the throat and the abutments. Then I flipped the plane over in the vise and used a pair of winding sticks and a metal jack plane to true up the bottom and take off a lot of twist. Honestly, this plane is in super rough shape, and I don't know if it's ever going to be a fine performer, but it's definitely good enough to test our iron. So I've got it set up. Let's go. Okay, I did not try this off camera. You can see this is an edge fresh from the mill. Never been planned. And I genuinely don't know what's going to happen. Let's see. Oh, hey, hey, that's a good sign. Let's take a few more. Okay, second stroke ever. Pretty excited about that. Okay, here's our shaving. I'm sure we could go thinner, but the point is, it works. So, was that? actually worth all the effort? But it kind of depends. Sometimes you've got a plane that you just have to get working. We've all been there. Maybe you got a good deal on an awesome old infill plane and you have to know how it works. Maybe you've gotten your first wooden plane and you are dying to know what all the fuss is about and you are going to get that thing working. Well, the good news is what we went through today was basically Basically everything that can be wrong with an old iron and have it still be salvageable. We went through everything. And yeah, it took a huge amount of work, but you know what it didn't take? Money. I didn't have to spend any money. The supplies were super cheap. Sandpaper, oil, stuff you have sitting around. Uh, if you don't have a big belt sander, you could use a grinder for this. You probably need a grinder for some of these restorations, but those are inexpensive too. You can buy a used one. The point is, we got the thing running again. And sometimes these old irons are worth the trouble by themselves. Sometimes. They're better than modern irons. They're very thick. That soft steel does seem to dampen vibration a little bit. And that ultra hard tool steel bit that they forge weld on there is sometimes a little bit harder than a Stanley iron, for instance. Not always. Heat treating was very hit or miss back in the day. I don't go in for any of that mumbo jumbo about old Sheffield irons. There's good ones and average ones, and there's crappy ones. Either way, now you know basically everything I have to tell you about this. Don't forget about my sharpening class with James from Wood by Wright and Anne from Anne of All Trades. 90 minutes, live on Zoom, mountains of information that you're not going to get anywhere else. Click the link down in the description if you're interested in that. If you need a long jointer plane like this, but you can't get one, consider building one. I made this transitional style triplane out of an old Stanley that was broken. I just pulled some parts off of it and then laminated together the body out of scrap that I had in the shop. How's it work? Let's take a look right now. It works just fine. It's a very satisfying project. I won't say that it's easy, but it is free if you have an old plane that can donate some parts. We've got a complete build video, a very thorough set of plans. We'll put the links to all that stuff down in the description. Patreon.com slash Rex Kruger. I only get to make these videos because people help me make these videos. Go on over there and check out all the rewards we have for the folks who make these videos possible. I'll see you next time. Thanks so much for watching.